Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. All right, shift happens. Let's talk about that a little bit. You know, Racia did a wonderful job talking about shift, and uh, Anthony and I knew that we were going to share a little bit on shift, so we were waiting to see where he was going to go before we sort of put together what we wanted to say. But anytime I hear the word shift, I don't know about you, but I always hear in my mind paradigm shift. Anybody hear that? Paradigm shift. Well, I remember years ago I heard that, and I thought, well, that sounds cool, but I don't know what that means. So, you know, I studied that out. Oh, my notes are out of order. Let me read to you the definition. A paradigm shift is defined as a fundamental change in approach or an underlying assumption. You know, they have a term in philosophy, and it's called an axiom. And it's basically the fundamental principle of what you believe that's laid out as a foundation that you build everything else upon. Uh, your philosophical axiom will determine who you marry, how you do life. All of the elements are built upon that fundamental axiom. But if somebody can prove your fundamental axiom to be false, you have to lay a new foundation, and it changes your entire paradigm, which is your perception of reality, right? The greatest paradigm shift that you ever experienced is when you got born again. Because you were living life one way, you were seeing life, your implicit sense of life had filters. It was shaped by parents, by teachers, by coaches, by TV, by movies, right? And then one day, I remember before I got saved, somebody came up to me and said, hey man, you know Jesus? And I just laughed. I said, dude, even if he's real, how could I know him? It's ridiculous. It's a stupid question. Now I find myself going around asking people if they know Jesus. I had a paradigm shift. I found out he's knowable, right? So we must have a shift in the church. We have to have a shift in our life. Just as man once thought that the earth was flat, a shift in scientific understanding can birth a complete renaissance in the way we, we think and do life. Uh, and open us up to a new realm of possibility thinking. How many people stepped into a whole new paradigm of possibility thinking when they found out that God was a God of promise? Oh my God, we started dreaming, right? Martin Luther's revelation of justification by faith in Jesus Christ alone, apart from works, was a paradigm shift that birthed a reformation in the church. It completely changed the way People did church, right? The common man was told that he had to go to somebody uh, of preeminence in order for the Bible to be interpreted properly. And Martin Luther said, no, everyone should have a Bible. Everyone should read the word for themselves because everybody received the Holy Spirit when they got born again. And the Holy Spirit is the teacher of the church, right? We have an unction from the Holy One and we know all things. Or at least we have access to the knowledge of all things through Jesus Christ. Changed our paradigm. My personal definition of shift is a shift in the spirit. Uh, a shift in the spirit is when the third dimension has an encounter with the fourth dimension. Right? We live in a third dimension. And if we never have an encounter with a fourth dimension, we don't even know that a fourth dimension exists except for other people tell us who we think they're crazy, right? And then one day we have a fourth dimension encounter. It completely changes the way we do life, right? And it bursts a hunger and a thirst for us to live in the fourth dimension because that's where all the blessings are. Now, there are blessings in the third dimension, but they have their genesis in the fourth dimension. Question is, can we birth a shift? What is our role and our responsibility? When I asked myself the question, I'm typing this out, for my notes, can we birth a shift, question mark? I found that I had to push the shift key to get the question mark to print on the paper. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit began to deal with me and said, keys make shift happen. So I want to share with you some keys that make shift happen. Number one, in Daniel 10, 12, 
we find that Dan, well, prayer and fasting make shift happen. Daniel prayed for three weeks. Prayer and fasting for three weeks. And the angel of the Lord showed up and he made this statement. He said, your words were heard and I have come as a consequence of and in response to your words. Well, how many people know when the angel of the Lord shows up in your bedroom, shift happened, right? But what, what triggered that? Prayer. Now, we know that it took three weeks because there was a war in heaven and there had to be a portal open through his prayer and intercession for the angelic blessing to come and give him the understanding. It also said that he humbled himself and that he desired and sought understanding. So motive is important. Prayer and fasting for the wrong motive doesn't really get it done. Right motive, right words, births a shift. I have found over the years that communion can make a paradigm shift or birth a shift. I never minister take the platform without first taking communion. Because I don't think you want me to minister to you from the third dimension, do you? No, you want fourth dimension teaching, right? I know that I'm just not a good enough teacher or speaker to do anything on my own. Uh, but Anthony and I both in the office there, we humbled ourselves and said, Lord, we need you, right? We need to give the word of the Lord. So we took communion together before we came out here. In Luke 24, 30 and 31, we read the story about Jesus after just being raised from the dead that day, engaging two men going down a road who were heartbroken over the fact that those that they thought, or the man that they thought was going to be the deliverer of Israel from Roman oppression was crucified and put in a tomb, and they thought, it's over. And so they were blinded by grief and sorrow and cynicism. They felt betrayed. And as they're walking down the road, Jesus comes up beside them, walks with them, and says, hey, guys, what's going on? And they look at him like, what's going on? Are you serious? Are the only one in Israel that don't know what's going on? And he goes, no, tell me. And they said, the one we put our trust in was killed, put on a cross, put in a tomb. He walked with them, spent the entire day with them. They constrained him to come to dinner and spend the night. Jesus blessed and broke bread with them. And the Bible says that their eyes were opened in the breaking of bread. That means as we take communion and we bless and break bread with the Lord, our eyes will be open. Communion can birth a paradigm shift. And sometimes you're only six inches away from your new paradigm. I mean, Jesus was walking with these boys and they didn't even recognize him. That's sad, but it's also encouraging for us because we think God is way far away. He might be right there waiting for a shift of perception. Prophetic decrees and proclamations and confessions can birth a shift. Job 22, 28 Job said, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall be upon thy ways. God makes decrees from heaven for the events of the earth. But in order for them to manifest in the earth, he needs people to agree out loud with their mouth with his decree. As the Bible says in the testimony of two or more, every word will be established. We have authority in the earth because we are the sons of Adam, right? God is in heaven looking for a man that will speak. At the very least, say amen if it's the truth, right? Say so be it. But it's better to say, I received that word and now I'm going to shout it on the housetops. I'm going to open a portal and pull down God's will from the fourth dimension into the third dimension with my words, with my decrees. King Cyrus wrote out a proclamation. He saw his destiny in the scriptures. He wrote it out and he posted it for everybody to see before he went in and sacked Babylon and delivered the children of Israel. Praise and worship can birth a shift. I mean, this is obvious to us, but we, we need to get it in our spirit. Second Chronicles 5.14, the house was filled with a cloud as they worshiped God even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. The, the glory of God filled the house. Now, along with worship, there was sacrifice, right? And, and, and as the glory goes up, this is a, 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 a law. 
or um, excuse me, when the sacrifice goes up, the glory comes down, right? The offering, when the sacrifice goes up, the glory comes down, the soul is made fat. As we worship God in, in song, as we go from praising to worship, we solicit heaven to get in concert with our worship. The presence of God comes and fills the temple with glory. Anything is possible in the glory, right? Our one objective should be to bring the glory into the house of God, right? To bring the glory into the house of God. The surrender to waiting. Whew, controversial. The surrender to waiting can birth a shift. Isaiah 40, 31, but those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Waiting there does not mean do nothing. Waiting means that you connect your heart with God's heart in, with intention. You have an intentionality like Paul. I have one desire to know him and the power of his resurrection. Because as you get before the Lord and you begin to pray and desire and hunger for a heart connection, right? Uh, if, as you draw nigh to him, he draws nigh to you. And what's happening? Your heart is weaving. Literally, the word wait means to weave or convolute. It means that you braid your heart into God's heart. Why is that season of waiting and convoluting so important? Because you might have sufficient braiding with God in your present season. But when you go into your next season, the winds of adversity might be so fierce that if you're not braided properly, you uproot, right? So when you get ahead of God and say, well, I'm tired of waiting. I'm just going to go into my destiny. Okay, here come the winds, right? That's why we see a lot of rocket preachers go up. Oh, my God, look what he's doing. Oh, my God, what happened, right? Bam. Not enough waiting time. Not enough weaving and braiding time where you connect, okay? <clears throat> Spiritual hunger can birth a shift, Job said in Job 23, 12, I have esteemed the words of his mouth, the words of God, more than my necessary food. Now, anybody that's ever fasted realizes how driven we are to eat, right? Imagine you had that same sense of drive three times a day to cleave to the word of God. What kind of response do you think you would get from God? Hunger will birth a shift. Prophecy and impartation can birth a shift. 1 Timothy 4.14, Paul said to Timothy, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy and the laying on of hands. His whole destiny was changed by a prophetic word by the apostle and the impartation of the giftings and the callings of an evangelist that was placed upon him. It changed his life. But sometimes even though you know your life has been changed, old paradigms begin to creep back in. And he began to halt. And Paul said, dude, what are you doing? War a good warfare by the prophecies that went out over you and stir up the giftings that I gave you that are inside of you. Get in the game, dude. You live in a different dimension now. Don't let these older boys intimidate you. You're carrying the glory of God right? Just put your shoulders back, get into that crowd and let them know what God is saying, right? Environments and atmospheres can birth a shift. In Genesis 28, 16, Jacob woke from his, from, from his sleep and all of a sudden he said, surely the Lord is in this place, right? Do you ever go from one environment to another and all of a sudden it felt dark and creepy and heavy. And then you go from a creepy environment into a light environment. And you think, wow, anything's possible in this place, right? There are environments that are more conducive to spiritual moves than others. The devil is a territorial spirit, right? You know, you're just not going to go into places of dark strongholds and have great revivals. You have to pray and intercede and create a hole in heaven in order to bring God's glory down. But there's 
places that you can go where other men and women of God have prayed 24-7 for years and created an open portal where you can go and step into a rapid response from God. And it's just about environments or the plowing that others have done before you. Does that make sense? The anointing on holy men and women of God can birth a shift. Acts 15.15, 15, they brought the sick that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Now, I used to read that and think that Peter's form blocked the sun and created a shadow. But when the Bible says that the glory of God overshadowed the temple, it's talking about the shadowing of the glory, not the absence of light. So Peter's glory radiated. And when he walked down the street, people got healed from the overflow, from the fatness of his soul, if you will. Amen? Praise the Lord. Pastor Anthony, why don't you come up and carry this. Thank you, Pastor Tim. You know, I was sharing with, with Pastor Tim earlier as we were getting ready for this. You got this. Uh, I, was, I was preparing the message, and I was studying and, and, and getting everything ready. And as I was getting everything ready, I was sitting in front of the laptop, and then I started remembering the 94 earthquake. How many of you remember the 94 earthquake? How many of you don't remember the 94 earthquake? Okay, if you don't remember, just take my word for it. It's not a movie. I promise you. It really happened. Things happened. And I, and I, I was thinking about this, this earthquake, and I was remembering where I was in the time. And, and, I, and, you know, in California, living in California, you already know. Uh, you live in a land of earthquakes, right? You, you hear about it. There's earthquakes every day, even though we don't feel them. You know that there's going to be an earthquake. And next to Alaska, actually, we've had some of the largest earthquakes that our nation has ever seen. So you live here, you know that that's what you're going to get. You may not get the hurricanes or the fires, or I guess we do have fires. You may not get the hurricanes or the storms, but you'll get some earthquakes. And in the 94 earthquake, I, I'll, I'll never forget after that because... During it, I remembered how significant it was. I remember exactly how things were shaking and moving and, and tearing apart. And, 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 but what I, I also remember is that I'll never forget how prepared my mom was for this earthquake. I'll never forget how we camped out on the front lawn for about a month after the earthquake was over in a two-man tent using gallons of water for showers she was so prepared that she had like an aftershock survival kit. She had things to, to keep everyone safe and secure. And I remember all my friends already going back in the house. And here we were, the last ones on the lawn, still waiting for everyone, everything to settle, even though everyone's already doing their thing and crying because I wanted to take a normal shower again. And, and, and I'll never forget that. But I'm also reminded today, look, looking back on how that was, I am far from being prepared for a disaster like that. I am far, if there was a big one today, I'm sorry, but I just wouldn't be ready. And that's just being honest. And I just thought about that as I remembered the 94 earthquake. And I remembered how big it was. And then I started to think, well, learning about earthquakes, I just know from knowledge of experience that we always associate the power and strength of an earthquake based on what we see shaking on the surface. We base the power and strength of an earthquake based on what the news reports that the Richter scale measured, a 6.9, a 6.4, uh, 7.0, whatever. But we, we try to measure what we see. In reality, the movement started happening under the Earth's surface where no one can see. And believe it or not, it only takes about 20 centimeters of movement for a 6.9 magnitude earthquake to actually happen. That's what happened in Japan in 95. A 20 centimeter shift of the tectonic plates caused a 6.9, enough energy and power to move and shift 70 US city blocks. A 6.9 earthquake from 20 centimeters, seven inches of movement of tectonic plates. And I thought about, and I'm thinking, in my perspective, I always imagine a big shift to happen. If, if there's a big earthquake, I imagine there has to be a big ripping, a big pulling, a big tearing, but that was not the case. And then thinking about how I often anticipate 
shifts to happen in life, I started to wonder, am I expecting this big shaking movement to happen in my life in order for me to determine the power of what God can do in my life? Am I, am I anticipating this big thing that everyone's drawn to, this big exciting event to happen in order for people to recognize that's how big God is? Or am I willing and okay with the thought that just maybe God's already started shifting things that no one else can see so that when people look and see what's happening, they can realize, wow, there is a God. I, I, I had to think, God, what are you doing on the inside that, that no one else knows about that would cause such a rupture, such a earthquake, a shaking on the outside? And for whatever reason, we tend to associate God with doing these great things. And, and, and we say things like, if it's not big, it's not God. But I just have problem remembering where God limited himself to just doing big things. I, I don't remember God being a God where he said, I only do the big things and I ignore the small things. In fact, Jesus used this example in Matthew with a mustard seed. And he said to his disciples, he said, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And though I know that a lot of the attention we put is on the mustard seed, I looked and noticed that, well, it wasn't like he was saying, go from no faith to mustard seed. He was saying, go from little faith to just a little bit more faith. I'm not asking you to go from little faith to Goliath size faith to move the mountain. I'm asking you, if you would just pay attention to the little shifts in your faith, if you would just notice the little adjustments, if, if you could just change the way you think in just a small capacity, you can move mountains. Uh, he wasn't requiring a big, showy, glory cloud type of movement to take place in order for you to have faith to believe for the impossible. He's just saying, would you think a little different? Would you act a little different? Would you pay attention and just believe a little bit more than usual. It's in the little things. Naturally, we talk about that scripture and we think about the mustard seed. But I was also reminded of how Jesus used a child to give us an example of how the little things give us permission to believe for the big things. And he brings a child, Jesus brings a child on his lap, and he's like, hey, if you would have faith like this child. And now, it would have been very interesting if he grabbed one of his disciples and said, if you have faith like this man, you can do wonderful things. But he brought a child. He brought a child, and I believe that shattered every religious conception that God needs to be this big, untouchable thing. But he said, it's, if you would have faith like this innocent child who will not let anything get in his way of believing, then the impossible will become possible for you. Just believe like a child. So, so we, we put God in a box, though we want him to perform out of the box. We want him to do supernatural things, but we limit him to the big supernatural things when sometimes God just wants to be found in the little, small, still place where it's just you and him and no one else knows the kind of shift that's taking place in your life. Where he can't, he can't necessarily display the shift, but you know that it's there. But you know that something's happening. But you know that it may not be something you can share with everyone, but it has to change. Something has to develop. It has to grow. It has to become more than just something between me and God. But it has to start there between you and God before it can become more. I love this in, uh, in Luke chapter 16. It says, he who is faithful in a very little thing is also faithful in much. And he who is dishonest in a very little thing is also dishonest in much. See, if God can trust you and how you process through the small shifts in life, how much more can he trust you when you have a big display of his glory in your life? 
when you have the ginormous breakthrough where everyone's celebrating with you, how much more can he trust you or not if he can trust you when you're just trying to break through a simple addiction? When you're just trying to break through a mindset of offense because someone hurt you or betrayed you, and whenever you look at that person, you can't stand to be around them, but no one knows you're offended at them. The little things that no one else can see. When you're trying to move past a hurt in your life that took place that, that, that you're, you're, too vulnerable, you're too ashamed of to explain on how it may have came to be, but yet God knows what happened, and God's trying to console and develop you and heal you from that. See, if he can't trust you on how you process those small changes, how can he trust you with how you process the large ones and how you display his goodness and his faithfulness? It's determined in the little things. And before you go trying to shake up the world and try to make an impact, make a change, how about we start being faithful with the change he's trying to make in us? How about, we, we, what, what if we just entertain the idea that God was trying to develop an icon within you before you become the icon, before you became the influencer, before you become the leader, before you become the person who actually inspires others to change? What if he's trying to develop that inside of you first? And I think we miss that opportunity when we dismiss the small stuff. When we dismiss the small advancements, the small victories, the small challenges, when we dismiss them and all we want to see is the great, big, mighty things. There's nothing wrong with the great, big, and mighty things. But God is just as much powerful in the big things as he is the small. See, God is powerful, not what he does. God is power. So if he's as powerful as he is when the big things happen, if he's as powerful as he is when, when he can move mountains and he can make miracles take place that no one and doctors were dumbfounded at, if he could do all that, then he's just as powerful on the inside of you when no one else can see it. And Luke tells us that. He says, he who is faithful in very little things is also faithful in much. In fact, it's not that just God wants to trust you in little things. He actually, it's a must. He must be able to trust you in the little things before he can trust you. It's a must. It's a must. It's a requirement. He lets us know that. I want us to look at 1 Kings chapter 19. And before I get into this, you know, uh, a lot of times I am guilty of this. I set myself up to demand God to show up in ways that would blow me away, right? How many of you have asked God or asking God now for God to show up and do something that's supernatural, that's extraordinary, that would blow your mind? And I had to stop and ask myself, Anthony, why are you expecting and wanting God to blow your mind? He's already above your mind. Anything he does from this point forward is going to blow your mind, whether you can see it or not. The, the simple fact that we exist should already blow my mind. The simple fact that I woke up this morning should already blow my mind. But I'm waiting for some extraordinary move of God to come and to shift my attention when God's saying, you shift your attention and you'll see the move of God. You shift your attitude a bit and you'll see a move of God. You shift how you believe things, not just circumstantially, but believe things when there is no point in believing. And then you'll see that move of God. And Elijah, Elijah is, is hitting a place in his life where he's filled with fear, filled with worry, anxiety. He's running from his life. He's, he's looking for refuge, looking for safety, something that would keep him alive. And here he comes. He's, he's, he's making his way. He finds a cave, and he's in this cave. He's like, all right, this is my time with God now. Here I go. So he calls on God, and, and then God meets him there, and, he, and, and God says, hey, what are you doing here, man? Why are you in this cave? And this is what he says. He said, he said I've been very zealous and passionate for the Lord God of hosts, armies, proclaiming what is rightfully and uniquely his. Come on, he had an entitlement based on his drive and desire to see God glorified, honored, respected, worshipped, and he was disappointed that God's own people weren't doing that. So he had, he had a right to feel how he was feeling. And he says, For the sons of Israel have abandoned, broken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword and I, and I 
only I am left. And they seek to take away my life. So he said, God says, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by and a great powerful wind was tearing out the mountains and breaking the rocks in pieces before the Lord. And the Lord was in the wind. I'm sorry, I think I gave wrong translation. It's supposed to say that God was in the wind, um, according to what I've experienced. God's supposed to be in this big, so let me read it again. Uh, But the Lord was, he was not in the wind, and after the wind, there was an earthquake. So there's this powerful wind so strong that it broke rocks, but God wasn't in it. You've been facing the same bad report year after year, and something happens that you get this great report, but God's saying, hold on tight. There's more to come. Hold on tight. We're not, this isn't even it. This isn't even part of it. Hold on. So after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, you would hope that he'd be in this fire, but There was a fire, and the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle blowing. Another translation says a small whisper. A small whisper. It's hard enough to hear the sound of a whisper when life gets noisy. So I think that's why we're so conditioned to want this boisterous sound of a fire and powerful wind and the wind of God. And and he says, after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle blowing. And if you continue to read, you'll see that from that blowing is where Elijah was positioned and he encountered the presence of God. And from there, he gained the instruction that led to his great comeback. Not only his great comeback, but that would lead him to then uplift and promote his predecessor who would carry on the torch and it was in not the earthquake it wasn't in the fire it wasn't in the wind but it was in the small shift that took place in that moment in that moment that low whisper shifted Elijah's attention away from the problem and back on to God God He desires for you to understand that if you would just shift your attention a little bit, if you would just go from little faith to mustard seed faith. I'm not asking a lot of you, son. I'm not asking a lot of you, daughter. But if if you can just shift from a little, just a little bit more, man, the things you can do. Elijah, if you would just sit still enough and and go through the motions of the destruction in your life and go through the motions of the fear of what could happen if Jezebel catches up to you, if you could just go through the motions of the fire, if you could just go through the motions and you could just hang on a little bit, just a little bit, man, you'll see what I can do. You'll see what I can do. And God was not in the earthquake. He was not in the wind. He was not in the fire. But he was found in that still small place. Maybe... It's time to get back to a still small place with God. So that when shift happens, you can pay attention and listen to what's next. You can pay attention and be ready so that that little shift that happens when no one's looking will create this beautiful, glorious change that would impact generations, not just your generation, not just the world you're here today. But how many of you actually want to leave somewhat of a legacy where they can look back and say, man, if, if my dad, if my mom, if my brother, my sister, if they didn't make that small decision when no one was looking, I wouldn't have the life I have today. Man, if my leader, my friend didn't encourage me when no one else would, I wouldn't be here today. If I didn't stand 20 years ago and make the decision to believe for a supernatural healing when all else was failing and all else was saying no, I wouldn't be standing here holding heel today. It's being able to leave a legacy that says, hey, it started in the small things that led to the great things. It started with a 20 centimeter shift under the earth's surface that created this loud shaking on the top. And I'm going to challenge you that as we continue to go forward, we've had three weeks where we've discussed how to react when shift happens, what different shift 
looks like and, and, and also how to position yourself for a shift for when it comes. And I'm going to challenge you. You're either in a shift now or there's a shift about to happen. You're one or the other. I'm going to encourage you to not get moved by the noise that's all around, to not get moved by, see, trauma, drama, pain, th those are real things. Those are real things, but, but God wants you to seep past that to where you can rest a little bit in the still small place and find peace and find healing. And that's where it's at. So I'm going to challenge us that as we continue to go forward, that we're in a position where we can wait and see, okay, God, um, I need something big to happen. But I'm okay if we start right here when there's nothing, when I feel like I have nothing left, when I feel like I have nothing to give, when I feel like nothing's really happening, when even though I've been asking of this, nothing's really changed, but I believe and I trust that, that you're doing a movement where no one else can see. You're changing the position of my heart. You're changing the mindset that I've learned to adapt from past failures and past hurts, and you're renewing my mind. And you're changing it for something great. And it's through that that you'll find the strength you need to move forward in your shift. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.